This meeting is being recorded. Awesome. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Welcome to a special edition of Shaping EDU Live, a virtual town hall. We have a fun event planned today to mark the release of our 2019 communique. Do a quick recap of what we've been up to make some fun announcements and try to make sure my heart doesn't beat out of my chest because I've had so much coffee. So, some quick logistical notes before we get started. Um, if everyone could mute themselves to make sure there's no stray ambient noises as a distraction unless you're speaking, um, so please mute yourself. Uh, while the Zoom chat is available for free flowing discussions, we also encourage you to tweet along with hashtag ShapingEDU and again, as a practical matter, I'll ask everyone in the audience to keep themselves muted unless speaking. If you have a question at any point, feel free to raise your hand or ask the question in the chat. Our wonderful and talented graphic facilitator, Karina Branson of Converse Sketch, is here today to capture the magic in the form of the live sketch you see before, on, before you on your screen. More from Karina in a moment. Um, right now, I'm gonna do something a little rare, which is pull up a slide deck. Um, we don't actually do this a lot in shaping EDU um, as you know something intentional as we you know really encourage um, conversation. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, just give me a heads up, everyone, when you can see them. A quick thumbs up. Is everyone able to? Okay, Karina can see my screens. Wonderful, great. Okay, so. Um, First, first things first, uh, what is Shaping EDU? So we launched in, in 2018 when ASU CIO Lev Gonick, hi Lev, uh, thought it'd be cool to convene education leaders from all over the world to envision the future of learning in the digital age. So we did that in April 20, in 2018 and it definitely was cool. Uh, there, 129 of us came up with our founding principles, our hey, Sam. actions. Hey, Sam, would you mind to go to pro projecting those slides rather than them? Yes. In your view mode? Yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Excellent. Um, and so we came up with, 129 of us uh, came up with our 10 founding actions to shape the future of learning in the digital age. So these are our 10 founding actions. And they really become the core and foundation of everything um, that we're doing. So for those of you who are new to the community, um, everything from promoting access and equity to recognizing all forms of learning to embedding data-driven approaches uh, in, on student success. And you could read more about all of these actions on the Shaping EDU website, which is shapingedu.asu.edu. Um, so for 20, in, in 2018, we decided it would be great to give everyone a, a better sense of what those 10 actions were all about. So we launched our Shaping EDU Live series, which was essentially a series of live events, much like this one, where we've done a deep, deeper dive into each of those 10 actions. You can find the video recordings of those posted and freely available on our website as well. Um, so when it came to thinking about the 2019 on conference and what we might do a little differently, we knew it was up to us to, to collectively advance these 10 actions and build upon them. So um, what, we, what we did for our 2019 on conference is we invited participants to submit utopian and dystopian visions for 2039. Uh, so 20 years from now, a full generation from now, what would they envision the world looking like if we fully, fully realized one or more of our 10 actions? And what would the world look like if we completely ignored them? So here's one example on the screen. I'm gonna pick on Kim because it was a really, a really great one. Um, so our dreamer doer drivers submitted these uh, wonderful um, scenarios to our community. And several of them, uh, about a dozen were picked uh, to see the unconference and become the subject matter and jumping off point for several working discussions that took place across ASU's Memorial Union. Um, there were students, educators, designers, researchers, technology leaders, education institutions, organizations, corporations, everyone and their mother is involved. Um, it was a great event and everyone focused on taking these, um, these future scenarios and figuring out strategies 
and concrete outputs for actually achieving the utopia uh, in 20 years or less. Uh, and so what the unconferences really did was solidify further who we are. And we know who we are. Uh, shaping EDU is a community of dreamers, doers, and drivers shaping the future of learning in the digital age. Uh, the vision is for change-making individuals uh, across the world to collaborate on big ideas for transforming education. Um, Karina, I'd like to ask you really quickly as we kind of uh, pause after reflecting on both on conferences and record time, what you felt maybe the biggest distinction was um, between the two years as you were a graphic facilitator both times. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm calling in uh, for my audio. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Great. Awesome. So there's three main things that I really felt were um, different between 2018 and 2019. And um, the first is clarity. So 2018, of course, was our inaugural year. And so coming in with um, 2019, there was less formal presenting. And at the same time, there was more clarity and direction around where the group wanted to go. So this nice kind of tension dichotomy, but really understanding the power of, um, of the people in the room to make the decisions rather than dictating it ahead of time. Um, there was also a lot of momentum in terms of the people who had uh, been in, at both, but also new people who had been kind of tuning in to the Shaping EDU Live moments throughout the year in between, and then relationships. So those relationships that were built um, back in 2018 facilitated, I think, deeper and more authentic connections. So, you know, respectful, uh, challenging each other, but really building on these ideas to move beyond, I think, what could be done um, the first year. So those are kind of my highlight takeaways. Hey, thanks for the insights, Karina. Yeah, so what was really emerged for me is, you know, the first couple words here that shaping EUDU is a community. But to me, it's also more than a community. It's really a lifestyle, right? So shaping EDU, shaping is a verb on purpose because we are action oriented. So if you're new to this community and you're the type of person that when someone asks, wouldn't it be cool if you're already doing that thing before the person answers the, <laughs> asks the question, then you really come to the right place. Um, Lev, as a founder of the community, I'd love to toss it over to you and hear some of your remarks and reflections in the past uh, year or so. Well, thanks, Sam, and, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be uh, here on this day uh, to be able to sort of be part of the sharing out of the 2019 gathering. And um, I hope, like many of you, uh, I've had a chance to read through it and, and very excited to kind of see where the dialogue goes uh, later through the day. Uh, I, I would sort of share that, you know, 2018, uh, we had an idea. Uh, you know, there was a context. Uh, around um, a kind of notion that it might be the right time to try to uh, frame and design a new community of practice, uh, a little bit different than any that we've, any of us had perhaps experienced in the past, but perhaps drawing on the strengths of some of the most important and enduring qualities of uh, the communities of practice that we've been part of. But by the time we got to 2019, it's underscore point that Karina made. I, I do think that... Um, there was a degree of pragmatism in 2019 in terms of things that could be actually, uh, made to be actionable. Um, and I felt like uh, from the work of the most pragmatic sort, uh, perhaps even the black swan conversations, uh, there was a degree of sort of building on uh, the work uh, throughout the year, not only just 2018, but throughout the uh, Shaping EDU live events uh, that uh, sort of uh, built up to the uh, to the gathering. Uh, so um, I, I very much feel like this is a community in the making. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of that community. Uh, I, I think that it actually has very broad uh, interests uh, in ways that is not just uh, the same old choir singing off the same old choir sheet. Um, I think the diversity of interests, the student voices, um, and the different perspectives from across uh, the uh, learning uh, enterprise, including corporate uh, learning, um, and what we certainly have tried to advance here around universal learning, the idea that we actually uh, are part not only of a continuum, but a continuous uh, process of uh, learning 
and being part of the design of our own future learning. I think those are all really important elements that I feel um, not only do, do I gain something from, but I, I think I speak for a number of my colleagues here. We're very pleased to be part, and we're looking forward to very pragmatic ways uh, of advancing it. And I think one of the announcements that uh, we'll share later in the hour uh, is a very, I think, practical way of trying to advance the work uh, and continue to build the momentum. Sam? Thank you so much, Lev. Uh, and as Lev mentioned, that Shaping EDU Live series, uh, which I'll share again, is available on our website. Um, each of the 10 actions has its own video associated with it that does a deeper dive on that action uh, with a panel of experts from across the world kind of chiming in on you know what the landscape of that action looks like and how to drive it into a reality. Um, and then to build on Karina's point about distinctions between 2018 and 19, um, and Lev had mentioned there were students present at the 2019 unconference, and it is our aim to always embed student voice and student agency whenever and wherever possible within Shaping EDU. So, uh, today at our special town hall, I'm pleased to be joined by several expert, uh, several neighborhood experts lovingly referred to as our mayors. Uh, everyone, if you, mayors, if you could give a little, a little bit of a wave. Hi, mayors. Um, so our mayors have been with us, you know, pretty much since day one. There's a couple of new faces in there. Um, but by and large, these are people that have a major stake and expertise in each of the 10 actions. Um, and so at our uh, unconference, when, when we came up with these actions, many of them were present. And many of them, uh, most all of them were present at the 2019 unconference as well. Uh, they're going to be joining me here in a minute live to kind of go over and discuss their take on the themes listed um, in the communique. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and pull up my communique screen. And while I'm doing that, uh, mayors, um, that are responsible for governing the specific shaping EDU neighborhoods. I'd love before we bring up the communique to ask you to briefly introduce yourselves. Uh, we saw the neighborhoods that you preside over, so you know, make sure to bring that back up when you mention your names, your job titles, and your institutions. Um, so Paul Signorelli, let's start with you first. Hey Sam, Sam, sorry, really quick. Can you mute Cyprian? There's a lot of noise coming from that. Oh sure, absolutely, let me see. Thank you. If we can't, you can just mute me because I probably deserve to be muted too. <laughs> so introduction, Paul Signorelli. I'm a San Francisco-based writer, trainer, presenter, and consultant, and working with Shaping EDU since the beginning with many, many other people that are in this session today. And I'm co-mayor with Jonathan Nalder from Australia, wonderful, wonderful place, someday I hope to be there, of the uh, neighborhood that's on education and the workforce of the future. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Paul. Tom, on to you. I'm not Paul. <laughs> no. Greetings from Texas. Um, Tom Hames. Um, I don't know what I am. I guess I'm a consultant. I uh, work on a lot of different areas and uh, uh, my neighborhood philosophy is anarchy and uh, demolition wherever possible. Love it. How about you, Lisa Gustinelli? Yes, hello, Lisa Gustinelli. I'm here in South Florida. Um, I am the mayor for recognizing all forms of learning. I'm an IT administrator and a admin of instructional technology at a K-12 school. And that's about it. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks for joining us today. Ruben. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Ruben Puentadura. I'm an education researcher and consultant. And let's see, uh, I've worked in multiple areas over time. If I've developed a model for how to choose uh, uses of uh, technology called the SAMR model, so that hopefully the technology is more than just a fancy paperweight in a corner and actually changes things. And in the context of shaping EDU, I work as the mayor of access and equity. Well, for me, those are fundamental elements to keep in mind when we're thinking about what we do with technology. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that later, as well as being the groundskeeper for the Black Swan Pond. 
and I also have something else to say about that. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Ruben. Nancy. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Rubin. I'm the Dean of Continuing and Distance Education at Northwestern Health Sciences University in Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, I was lucky enough to join the community this year um, and I may, I'm the mayor of the Artificial Intelligence neighborhood. And I would just say that everyone has a role to play in the community. Um, you know, it's just, even if you just have a few minutes every week, um, I think that what we're doing really matters and I would just say that um, everybody here has a role to play. So we encourage you to stay tuned um, and join in the fun. Yay, mayors, did I miss anyone? I know there's a couple of you maybe tentatively joining, so pop on on if I missed you. Hi, it's Megan, I'm Megan Linos. I'm from uh, University of California, Irvine, and I'm the mayor of the personalized learning neighborhood. Um, so uh, we're looking for ways to um, shaping um, students' learning experience to tailor what they needed. Awesome, so happy to have you with us, Megan. And there are a number of others uh, who couldn't join us here today. Uh, so I encourage you to check out the Shaping EDU website that has all the mayors listed. Um, speaking of mayors um, and getting to know folks, last month we launched our new Slack workspace. So Slack is a real-time communication application that's making it easier for our community to connect around our 10 actions whether by sharing relevant news, prompting discussions, and surfacing potential project collaborations. Or this week, we happen to be having a rager of a virtual block party in the Constellation mm -hmm. channel. Um, by virtue of either attending the unconference, registering for this event, or both, you should have received an invitation to join the Shaping EDU Slack. If you're not in yet, check your inbox filters. If you've looked under every virtual couch cushion and still can't find it, email me at sam.becker at asu.edu and I'll resend it. And I see we're joined by Emery Craig. Uh, so nice plug for Slack here. Uh, Emery is in the Slack. If you'd like to introduce yourself, Mayor Craig. Sure, I am co-mayor, not mayor, co-mayor with Maya Georgieva. I, I think we're, is it the Immersive Learning Neighborhood? I'm not sure exactly what we're called it is, okay? And there's, there is my co-mayor. She always pops up at the right time. Perfect timing, Maya. Uh, <laughs> and so um, we're mayor of a fascinating little place because I don't see it as just a neighborhood. I see it as a whole urban environment that includes a whole bunch of neighborhoods because no matter what we're doing, I think immersive technologies and immersive learning are going to factor into all the different things that we're talking about. So, And outside of that, I'm co-founder of Digital Bodies, also with Maya. And uh, Maya, I'll let you add whatever you want. So. Hi Sam, hello everyone. Um, it's, been, it's been just like a, one of the best rides I think in the last two years to be uh, a mayor of the, co-mayor of the Foster Immersive Learning Neighborhood at Shaping EDU and it's just been incredible to attend both events and just have continue these conversations um, and at this around this topic of virtual augmented mixed reality AI as I already said this actually is the future of education. It's going to basically be a convergence of a number of different things that are happening, um, not just in the technology realm, but in the design and experience realms. And so very, very much exciting to moving into that next stage and um, you know, participating in all conversations and into the next uh, year of the next 10 action. Excellent. We're so lucky to have you both, Emery and Maya, Thanks. be co-mayors in our community. Um, so if you want to talk more to Maya and Emery, they'll be in the Slack, and we'll be leveraging our Slack to extend the conversations after this event as well as during this event. That's right. In a moment, we'll be sharing the just-released 2019 Shaping EDU Communique and launching a number of related polls in the town hall channel of our Slack. Every theme in our Communique corresponds with a set of calls to action dreamed up by all you dreamer doers and drivers at the 2019 unconference. And all the calls to action will be placed into polls, one poll per theme, and you will have the ability to assert which calls to action you'd be interested in working on. As we grow our community, it's important to get a sense of real the, where the real traction lies. Um, in fact, one of the calls to action is already in the works through a very exciting partnership, 
and I look forward to inviting in some friends to share that good news with me after we walk through the community together, so be sure to stick around. Okay, without further ado, the final communique. Uh, can everyone see it up on my screen? Just give a thumbs up. Yeah, awesome. So in April, we circulated the first uh, draft to unconference attendees for feedback, implemented it, and then shared it with the public for feedback. So uh, thank you to all who contributed, and especially our co-conveners for making it possible, and they're all listed in the communique. There are several interim products linked to in the forward of the communique itself, and our website encompasses all the videos, photos, and art from both unconferences. The communique is also freely available on the Shaping EDU website, and these 10 themes we're about to share, or the mayors are about to share, reflect a synthesis of all of this work. Um, I want to give a huge shout out and thanks to Laura, Ge Laura Geringer for all of her work on the final communique alongside me, and of course, Karina Branson for the amazing original art. All right, to walk you through each theme are several of our mayors that have two minutes or less to share the perspective on each theme. Uh, and so to keep things on track, I'm gonna chime back in kindly if you go long. Um, so we're gonna start with the first theme, which is all about innovation and technology. So over to you, Emery. Well, you're muted. Emery, you are on mute. <laughs> Innovation and technology. Maya, do you want to start in on this and then I'll chime in or what? <laughs> well, I think that I think that I kind of preface this. We are living in a super connected, fast paced world. And with that, um, we're faced with a number of different challenges and, and in, in our world and so is in education as we transform education to address those challenges and address, you know, the basically how uh, we educate better, um, more, you know, in a, create new models of learning, create new financial models, create new experience models for our institutions, and ultimately, um, basically, transform education. So I think um, that uh, in 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 that sense, it's the idea that innovation will happen in different parts um, of our ecosystem, uh, and how do we kind of like tap and drive forward to achieve the best we can do for our students, for our institutions, and uh, advance the field. And I think missing learning is, is one area where we're particularly passionate. We feel like there is an opportunity. Um, and so I'm really excited to continue that conversation. Right. Um, I, I just add to that that I think when you know oftentimes when we hear the word innovation the next the next word is always disruption and you know the the tech industry prides itself on that and, and while we want disruption in higher education it's not the only thing we want because it's about much more than just disrupting the status quo we need to create something new and that's really what we have to be focused on here and the other thing that that I think is important and we all need to keep keep uh, an eye on is that it's never about one technology, it's about the convergence of different technologies. I mean, if you look at our smartphones, which we're all wedded to, they're not just a single technology, it's display process, it's processors, it's display, it's presentation technology. And I was just a couple weeks ago, I was at a conference in the Middle East on artificial intelligence, and I was thinking a lot about immersive technologies, virtual reality, and AI, and how those are all gonna converge together. And we really need to see how the innovation that's happening is not just one technology innovating, it's a convergence of all these technologies at one, and that's what we have to master and move on from. Well said. Everything. Okay. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, Tom, Mayor of Humanizing Learning, Talk to us, us about the theme of human-centered everything. Oh my God. Okay. Um, well, I mean, it's uh, you know this topic is everything and uh, at, at once in a sense. I mean, it encompasses many of the other topics. If you read the calls to action and the and the uh, survey, I mean the synopsis in the uh, in the communique, you know it it touches on a lot it of. On a lot of different factors sorry, sorry. Uh, am I echoing or is that somebody else doing that okay I think you're um, okay. all right okay um, 
And so uh, I think if I were to sum this up into a few bullet points, a few quick words, first of all, I think what's happened over the last several centuries or year, 150 years is we've effectively dehumanized education by industrializing it and turned our students into widgets. And so I think what we're trying to do here is to rediscover, re refeel our way back out to a pre-industrial educational model that does not involve uh, warehousing hundreds of students into lecture halls and then giving them tests, which they forget the day after they've, they've taken them. Uh, to make education meaningful, to make it a human experience rather than a transactional experience. Um, and the upshot of that is that in all of these technologies, the design has to start with the human and it has to recognize that humans evolve and change. Um, I, my, one of my favorite books that I'm going through right now is, is the uh, uh, Ann Pendleton Julian and John Seeley Brown book, uh, Design Unbound, talking about emergent design. Well, emergent design is fundamentally human design. design. And so as we design systems, as we design systems of education, as we design structures and organizations of education, not just the technologies, we have to recognize that organizations are also technologies. But um, as we design those, we have to be rea realistic about how humans evolve and change and how those things are going to be challenged and uh, pulled into various directions over time. So I hope that was adequate. <laughs> it was beyond adequate. Thank you, Mayor Hames. Um, Mayor Heather McCullough couldn't be here today um, in North Carolina. Uh, so she is the mayor of Building Constellations of Innovation. The Constellations channel has been where our virtual block party has been raging in our Slack workspace. Um, but this one is all about um, communities. We know that communities of practice are very important. Communities of leadership are important. But how often and how visible are we making these communities, these kinds of communities available for students? Right now, the burden really is on students to find their community, to find their people. But this one is all about what could institutions do? What could institutional leaders do? Individual colleges, schools, various departments, informal learning pioneers. What can we do to make opportunities to deeply connect with other like-minded and different folks uh, available to learners? Um, I'm thinking, you know, in my own professional life, um, shout out to Squad Goals Network, shout out to Ed Search Loop. There's so many different communities I'm involved in, of course, Shaping EDU being chief among them, but um, it it's becomes easier, you know, as you, as you work and as you learn about new opportunities, but when you're first getting um, to college, if you're a first generation, whether you're a first generation student or you, you feel you know your way around, it's so, so important uh, for learners to feel supported. So how are we really handling that and what could we be doing better and differently? Next, the lines between face-to-face, -face, online, and hybrid learning must blur. Uh, Maya, I'd love to get some intel from you on that one. Hello. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I think that education, you know, we are all working, I think, towards a model of a lifelong learning and education happening in any place, any time. It's kind of like where we had it as as knowledge and from, you know, creating knowledge is, is an ongoing constant process and that co-creation process. And so we, I think, as educators need to evolve our models in terms of, you know, creating a better design where, you know, where things start and where they go, where, how do we uh, create opportunities for conversations to begin in the classroom or some, some kind of space uh, where we're together and then extend into online um, spaces with uh, possibly mentors and coaches and others. Um, and I think that is the idea of just hybrid and, and, and blended learning and basically opportunities for new models. Um, and I see online, so I see these spaces, not just as um, ultimately uh, being there to, to, to kind of sit in, in, in creating only the, their component, but I see them mutually kind of collaborating and um, being very much creating the synergy for just uh, a much more uh, inclusive and better education. So to me, that's, um, that's I feel like it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to all embrace. Thank you, Maya. And over to you, Paul, representing education and the workforce of the future on this next theme. 
Great. If we do this right, I will try to imitate the sound of Jonathan Nalder's voice. Let me see if I can channel him. Jonathan, if you were here, what would you say? Uh, I don't know. Can you recognize my croaky voice at the moment, Paul? Do you believe it's me? <laughs> so this is actually a great representation of what happened for us at Shaping EDU. It builds on what anyone following this program at this point has heard about it pushing the limits on blended learning, on having immersive environments. Jonathan in Australia could not be there physically, but he was there very much virtually physically through the use of Zoom and through some other technology we had. And through that, we had some, some wonderful conversations with our whole group. We started off by setting goals for the neighborhood, which frankly is the formation of a plan to connect learning to workplace needs. Now, this is not news or new things for most of us that are familiar with this. There are decades of conversation and reports around it. And what we're hoping to do as a group to start looking at the resources that are out there. People have been looking at this much longer than we have looked at it. And to try to make a, a positive difference of what's going on. The challenges we're facing and that we identified as a group were finding success stories. We're actually starting to look at that and spotting some preliminary things that are quite promising. We're trying to work with different ways to differ and document, I'm sorry, to document skills and competencies in our workplace. Much of our discussion revolved around a comment that was kind of an offhand comment by someone saying, well, you know, uh, research shows that very few employers, a very small number, actually look at transcripts and grades when they hire. And our student on the group said, well, that's horrible. We should really be looking for something that ties that in better. So that's a challenge that we're going to be facing. We set up a variety of, of action items over the next year. And we hope every one of you watching this will join us in trying to make those action items um, come to fruition. That includes documenting and discussion examples showing successful connections between education and workplace needs. I'm exploring options for a universal learner record that sort of deals with that whole issue of what's a transcript for if nobody's looking at it, conducting some research and choosing specific workplace domains to serve as case studies. Jonathan, from your point of view from halfway around the world, what have I missed that you think was important out of that meeting and what we're doing together? Paul, I'm only going to comment on the, the bigger picture just of how great it was. Having, having a group together and also the just having shaping EDU even looking at this topic um, and again, from, from my perspective, I think <laughs> there's, there's the distance thing. You know, it's very indicative of if we're going to solve these kind of problems that we actually have to reach as far, you know, as far as we can. Um, it's such a, an intangible problem and without you know, the much bigger perspective. And I guess um, one of the things I'd like to see for us to do as well is even bring in some, some more international perspective, I guess, and find out um, as, we, as we sort of move forward with this. Um, how are different people coming up with solutions? I think that's what's awesome about the whole Shaping EDU community, actually, is that super wide perspective. Um, Great, thank you. Increases, and for the, increases uh, the chances so much more of coming up with solutions. Yeah. Thanks. We're looking forward to having you all drop by the neighborhood and become permanent residents, should you choose. And you can either give a thumbs up or thumb down to let me know how I did with imitating Jonathan's voice. <laughs> Well done. And just a reminder, speaking of the neighborhood and the education workforce channel, Paul and Jonathan are referring to, there are polls launching now in the Slack workspace towards these calls to action. This is an opportunity just to say, hey, yeah, I'd be interested in helping out with one of these calls to action, or this is where I see some real traction. Uh, now is the time to jump in the Slack. Um, so, Tom, I'm going to come back over to you for this next theme that's all about advocating for greater student agency and everything. Yeah, so I'm going to go completely against what Paul just said a moment ago. Um, I don't want people to look at transcripts and, and grades. It's precisely the opposite. Uh, I, think that, I think that we decided in our group, uh, and I think that was a fairly common refrain, even with people talking outside the group, except for Paul, uh, that grades are an extremely poor measure of uh, what students are. And um, we also have to remember, and I hate to use the crutch of millennials uh, and post-millennials, but one of the things that I think people miss when they're talking about, ooh, they're so different, um, is the fact that this generation or that generation and the succeeding generations are used to living in an environment where they can reshape their environments. Uh, and they grew up in a world of YouTube, Photoshop, Flickr, and now the, the new technologies, everything from VR and XR and so on and so forth, they're used to being able to write their own books, to write their own stories. And yet we shove them into 
uh, slots that are very rigid and structured. You're an A student, you're a B student, you're a C student, you're gifted and talented, you're good at math, you're good at English, you're good at, you know, and this is how you are defined. And they're, in many cases, disempowered, in some cases, by random chance. I mean, there are people who are, you know, you look through history at brilliant geniuses who were bad in school because they didn't conform to those realities. Well, we've hopefully raised a, uh, a universe of geniuses now that are starting to adapt to that. And if we don't adapt to that, we're in trouble. And this starts with assessment. And we have to figure out how do we measure the building product of what these students are doing. And at the end of the day, you know, I think it comes down to their makers in all senses of the word, not just physically, but in, in virtually as well. And so how do we develop mechanisms that show that, that makerness uh, a lot more effectively than some random number that's from a 16 bit universe of, uh, of uh, uh, PDP tens storing grades and stuff like that. That's, that's dehumanizing and industrial education is dehumanizing. And so if we really want to empower our students, we're going to have to start with that. I try very hard to empower my students all day long in my classes. And it always comes down to, well, how, what, how do I get points on this? How do I get the grade on this? Because that's what they're trained to do. Thank and you so much, Tom, for sharing. System. Yep. Much appreciated. And we'll be hearing uh, from Tom a little bit more later towards more the later. end of our program. Yep. Ruben, I'd like to toss it over to you to talk about open everything, from humanizing everything to open in student agency everything to open everything. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so this is open everything. So open resources, open education, open research. You know, this is great. One of the things is that we've been talking about this for quite some time. I mean, I go back to the days of the quantum chemistry program exchange where we didn't have enough bandwidth to send the program, so we actually shipped tapes around the world with open uh, software. And then later in the late 90s, for instance, we had the Learning Objects Exchange, a forerunner to many later open education, open resource initiatives. But the question is, why have we seen limited adoption? And what I think we need to talk about, our shifts are not just in, well, we're saving on the software or, well, we're saving money on the resources, but shifts that are more deeply cultural. So the first thing we need to think about is we're talking about sharing. We're not just talking about resources that are free from cost. We're talking about resources that are the tokens in a sharing exchange. And that's important to think about. So we need to think about the structures, the cultural shifts, et cetera, that need to happen in education to foster that. And once we have that, the second key element that we have is the question of attitude. You know, it's pretty easy to think about open education resources and to view it as sort of this giant buffet. And we all go with our plates down the buffet line and load up on all these OER. But we need to think deeper and more broadly and that. It can't just be about consumption. It has to be about production understood broadly. Creation of new resources, remixes, curation. In other words, that those people that participate in open education uh, resource usage are actually participating not from a passive but from an active relationship to those resources. So that's another key element of what we're looking at here. A third point then is if that's the context we have, we now need to talk about agency. It can't be that OER is just something that's given to me, or even if it's something I remix, well, I just have to wait for somebody to give me permission. I have to view it as something that gives me agency in that world. Whether I'm a faculty member, whether I'm a student, we're all learners in this. This is a community of learners. We need to talk about how OERs become the tokens, the means of agency in this world. And finally, to go back to my own mayoral group, then the last element of this chain becomes how OER goes from being an element of agency to an element of equity. Because we're now looking at resources that can be customized, personalized, specialized to the context of each learner relative to what they need, relative to their community, relative to what they would like to make. So this is a perfect context for the development of equity. You know, if you look at approaches, for instance, like universal design for learning, OER is a perfect complement and indeed almost a necessary complement universal design for learning. So that's the context in which I'm looking at this particular entry, this particular heading, and what I would like to invite people in Shaping EDU to participate in. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, let's go to our other Mayor Ruben, Nancy Ruben, mm -hmm. to talk about data. 
Um, so I think everyone knows, I mean, people have been using data for quite a long time. I think we're kind of swimming in data. And I think, um, I think we all know these themes kind of permeate across each other. So I think in, in this project, and it's um, important to look at how we're thinking about data, how we're using data, what data is available to us, um, how data can be used to personalize learning. Um, but I also think we want to look at it from the student perspective as well. So um, what are the most important data points and how are we using it ethically and how are we informing people about the data that we're using? Um, because there's a lot of information out there. Um, you know, institutions are, you know, creating data repositories, sharing data amongst each other. And I think um, how we think about um, what that landscape looks like is an important area that we can all have an impact on. So that's what this project is really about. Excellent. Next one, Nancy, let's just keep rolling with you since you are the mayor of Artificial Intelligence Town. Yeah, I'm kind of obsessed with it. So um, how, you know, and in this name, you know, so artificial intelligence is such a buzzword, but it's going to be applicable in everything that we do. Um, so I think we really want to understand it from a teaching and learning perspective. Um, so how can we use AI? It's already out there. Um, what products, you know, from a, a perspective, you know, from a development perspective, from a consumption perspective, and then also, again, looking at the ethics behind how we use these things. Um, so it's a really great time um, to be involved in these projects because we can have an impact. We can create a framework um, for how these things are thought about. So join us. We need you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, back to you, Ruben, um, our resident black swan catcher. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You don't catch black swans. You just look around them, you wrangle black swan, right? <laughs> uh, no, it, you know, the question for me is a question of how we look at the aspects of teaching and learning that are not predictable, so that we're not either caught unawares for something we should be prepared for, or uh, waste opportunities, miss opportunities that we didn't expect, and that's where black swans come in. Uh, black swans are events that cannot be predicted upon ahead of time, yet have a major effect, a major impact on the domains in which they appear. And finally, when you look at them, you say, oh, yes, retrospectively, you can say you expected them coming down the line. So, for instance, in the world at large, you look at something like, say, the economic crisis of 2008, and you say, yes, that's a black swan, because while you could talk about crises in general, you, nobody predicted that particular crisis with its particular aspects, how it affected the world economy, having the aspects that it did. In education, a black swan might be, well, the appearance of smartphones on the landscape. You know, prior to the introduction of the iPhone, different elements, different aspects have been played with. And yet everything came together, together with the App Store and some other elements to really change the dynamics of how people accessed information, shared information, shared images, etc., on a day-to-day -day basis. So there are many different types of black swans. And the question is, how would we deal with them? if we can't predict them. Well, what we can do is we can say, well, where are the nesting grounds that black swans come from? Or where do we see a nesting ground beginning to emerge? So nobody could have predicted 2008, but some knowledge, some understanding of certain contexts for how economic crisis, crises occur could have helped people deal better with 2008. Nobody knew that when the iPhone appeared, it was suddenly going to have an impact, you know, much, unlike or very different from other uh, smart, uh, smart type devices that have been created prior to it. But again, you could say, well, here's an opportunity that would arise had you been looking at a context for mobility, how mobility was being used, what you already knew from cell phones and so on. So what we want to do is we want to identify the nesting grounds of black swans. And that's uh, where I see you know, what we can do in shaping EDU. So we need to look at processes to identify nesting swans. It's not just a fixed set of you know, A, B, C, and D, and you'll know where a black swan is going to appear. You need to think about processes that allow you to uh, identify these nesting grounds because the nesting grounds shift, they change over time. Some are more stable, some fluctuate wildly. And then there's another aspect of processes that we can think about, almost processes about processes, which is fine. We identified the nesting grounds of the black swans, what do we do about them? If I'm a leader in education, if I am a learner, if I'm anywhere in the context of what happens in education and learning, 
how do I take that knowledge about those nesting grounds and say, ah, then this is knowledge I can use to decide how I'm going to move forward, what I'm going to be looking at, what am I looking for? So that's the type of thing that I'm hoping we can sponsor, uh, incentivize, etc., within the context of shaping EDU. And one of the things I'm very much looking forward to is leading some activities related to, well, call it bird spotting, I guess, uh, in the Slack community. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you so much. And while I'm transitioning with screen sharing and slides, um, Mayor Gustinelli made an astute observation about all of these themes and a, a, an undercurrent of all of them, or most of them, is authentic learning. So I'd love to invite Mayor Gustinelli up to give her two cents on the, the role that authentic learning plays. Okay, so um, if we wrap up all these different um, things that we've been talking about, and I'm glad I follow the black swan, because I think one thing we have to remember, and it fits in with the recognizing all forms of learning, is that because this technology is changing so quickly, the learners that we have, the groups of learners, um, come from a different learning environment very quickly. Like, for example, um, back in the day, you know, it was the same type of learning uh, that was going on year after year, you know, for 20 years, nothing really changed. Now, every few years, it, there are major impacts in the way students learn. So, the best way for us to grab their attention and to bring them in is to connect what they're learning to the society that they live in and to give it real life uh, re relevance. And the way we can do that is to give them challenges exactly, believe it or not, we are doing the model of what we should, what how students should be learning. They're get, we should be giving them challenges that aren't easily solvable, that require um, time and effort and collaboration and the availability of many open education resources in order to come up with, uh, to define a problem. So it's funny how we are now at like the intersection of the educator and the learner where we're all going for the same thing. Um, Jonathan and Paul, your group uh, connecting that learner to the future um, of the workplace. But we're also in the workplace <laughs> and we have to change and we have to uh, adapt ourselves to be futurists in the way that um, we're, we're teaching and guiding the students. And the final thing is we and the students at the end need to create some kind of a product and be able to uh, talk about that pro product, tell the story about that product, and give the relevance to you know what we have um, taught them about because they want to know why am I doing this? What's in it for me? What? How will this help me? Because I could go off and do a lot of things on my own now. How would? How is the fact that you're there guiding me actually uh, helping me to do something that's relevant? Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. Uh, super, super crucial. Uh, thank you, mayors and everyone who contributed. The back page of the communique has all 200 contributor names. Check it out. It's super exciting. Here's a link where you could access the full communique and, all your, and tell all your colleagues and friends to, to do the same. Um, and here, again, is the new uh, official Shaping EDU art, courtesy of Karina. And you might make an observation that there's some new landmarks uh, around the Shaping EDU community, and one of those landmarks up towards the top right corner here is the Creativity Press and Lab. Uh, what is all of that about? Well, da -da -da -dum, time for the big announcement, um, and I'll ask um, to see if Ben Sprague is here uh, with Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. Um, the two people I wanted to have me joining uh, for this announcement, one was summoned to jury duty and the other is on an airplane right now uh, trying to log in through Southwest Airlines Wi-Fi. Um, but we're really, really excited. One of the calls to action that was come up with at the, um, at the unconference was an open access journal, open everything. Hey, Sam. Sam, yeah. Ben is here. Let's Ben's here. Okay, sorry, I cannot see the chat. Ben, 
Want to pop? Want to pop on? I don't know if you're able to ch enable your uh, video. Ben was expressing that he's having connection issues. He's only hearing every other word, so that might be why we don't hear him. Okay, no prob. Um, so Ben. Carry on. <laughs> Well, we will carry on, and Ben has said that he's happy to address any questions in the chat. Um, so I'm really pleased to share that we are going to make one of the calls to action a reality in partnership with Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at ASU to launch a special edition of, the, of, of their open access journal, Current Editions in Education, that is shaping EDU themed. Uh, so dreamer doers and drivers of all roles across, um, uh, across education be they educators, students, technologists, designers, can submit uh, papers to appear uh, in this open access journal. And those papers can definitely include all sorts of media. Um, and so we're really, really excited. Um, this announcement is up on our website. The link is now live on Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College website. Uh, the call for papers is now open as of right now. Yay! And we'll be launching um, the edition at the very, very beginning of 2020. So tell everyone you know, uh, the submission categories, of course, will be our 10 actions uh, plus more. So if you wanted to write something or you're doing work around access and equity, submit it. Connecting education to the workforce of the future, submit it. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Sean Leahy and Ben Sprague for making this partnership possible. And we're really, really excited about it and I hope you are too. Um, finally, before our final segment, um, if you like what you saw here today, great. We hope to see you back in Tempe for the next unconference in 2020. It's taking place March 11th through 13th at ASU. So save that date. We'll be sending out more information soon. Uh, finally, um, we have resolved to make, hopefully help people make some calls to action possible. We have three people uh, come in here today with pitches for various uh, calls to actions that they'd like to see um, made possible by this community. Uh, so these are really big ideas um, that people have. And first up, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And first up, I'm going to ask um, to see if Mike Sharkey is here to share his. Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Sam. Let me share. Hey folks, how are you? Mike Sharkey here. I am in, at ASU in Arizona. So let me get to this quick. Uh, Sam, can you see my screen okay? I can see your screen audio a little choppy, but because we're short on time, I just want to let you guys know if people are interested in these pitches and joining these various calls to action, please find Mike um, in the All Forms of Learning channel after this, and then our other project pitchers have other channels we'll be in, which I'll get to in a little bit. Thanks. So the pitch here is a knowledge taxonomy. Um, we've got all these different things that refer to knowledge, so objectives and assessments and competencies all point to knowledge, but it's Tower of Babel. We're not labeling them the same thing and, and numbering them the same way. Um, and in the putting myself in the doer category, um, if we can have a common system that will really help catalyze, like once GPS was put in place, all these other tools and apps fell off of it that the original designers didn't really account for. And I think we're in the same place. This is what I mean when I'm talking about a knowledge taxonomy, um, some way of taking knowledge and really organizing it and numbering it so that we can refer to it in a common format. Um, not a small thing. Uh, this covers lots of different disciplines. Um, some examples, the coordinate system for mapping and finding your way in directions, do a decimal system for finding books and where on a shelf to look um, in an old school fashion. Right? These are taxonomies that you know, put some organization around these topics. So my hypothesis is we create this, right? So 3.7 is microeconomics and adding fractions is 14.2.x.y. Um, I think it would help really catalyze other parts of so many things we've been talking about. Um, the biggest thing is this is not a billion dollar IPO idea. No one's gonna own this. No one's gonna use it if they have to pay to use someone else's knowledge map. Um, so it's gotta be this community developed thing, which is why I thought Shaping EDU is a great place to pitch it. Um, once you have it out there and it's curated and agreed upon, 
people dip into it and use it as a common language. So my ask here is to really help me vet the feasibility. Um, you know, there are some things we talked about today that I think some could argue if you had a system readable knowledge taxonomy, it would dehumanize things. And there's that's a great argument. And so, you know, I really want to have a minor debate first. Uh, do parts of it already exist? Would it cover anything besides knowledge? And how can we create it? I've got lots of thoughts on this, and I'll help moderate, but would love to hear folks already seated the conversation in all forms of learning. So I will pause there and send it on back. Thank you so much. Uh, next up for our call to action pitchers, I'd like to invite Lorenzo Vallone of Zenial Digital to come on down. Or up. Look at all those emails. I know, too many emails. Hi guys, um, glad to be here today. Thank you so much, Sam Love, for the invite. Um, my pitch is something that we've been working on for a while, actually. And the basic notion is to form a higher ed consortia for VR content creation, curation, distribution, and long-term management. So I want to sort of piggyback on things that Maya and, and others have said in this call about the future of, um, of VR as a tool for learning. Um, Zenial Digital's expertise is in extended reality, which encompasses virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. We've always had a focus on education, on social impact, and, and corporate training so we can pay the bills. Um, we developed a platform called XDVR Learning, which is designed for K-12 students and teachers to use uh, to basically have a very immersive experience around anything to do with science from biology, chemistry, physics, anatomy, etc. The platform itself has a lot of really interesting features, including multi-language. We're distributing it both in the US and Latin America today. Um, it has multi-user VR learning capabilities, so the ability for a teacher to take students on a tour of the human heart together, um, all through virtual reality, uh, all while in, in, in different headsets. Um, it has analytics, and we're going to be integrating with, with learning management systems in the near future. Um, our expertise is across all the devices, from HTC Vive and Oculus, and we were actually very fortunate to be one of uh, 30 out of 6,500 uh, applicants to receive a Magic Leap Creator Award. And, we're building a climate change visualization experience today with University of Miami uh, on that. Um, so today, the way we build immersive VR learning content, we have 13 experiences in our platform that we've released so far, but our plan is to ultimately release um, ideally hundreds and to make the platform extremely inexpensive uh, for teachers and students uh, in schools around the world to be able to, to access this content. But the way we build the content is in direct collaboration with K-12 teachers and students. They work directly with us in typically eight to 10 to 12 week sprints, um, often as an after school project. Uh, and then we basically work with the students as if they were part of our extended team from researching the idea to developing storyboards, to actually uh, writing code and getting involved with our team to understand how everything works together. We've had amazing success with three projects that we're running today. Uh, one is a consortium of New Jersey schools. There's two schools in, in Northern Jersey that are working with us with a group of 10 students to expand one of our experiences around echolocation and the Batcave. Another one which just started this week is with iTech, which is a magnet in Miami, which is basically going to be helping us build the entire 10th grade biology curriculum uh, over the summer to have a direct impact on retention and testing scores. And we're working on a project with Columbus around forensic chemistry uh, as well. So what is my goal here? My goal is to extend this collaboration to higher ed. This is a model that I, that I learned uh, from, uh, from folks that are in Australia that are doing the same thing. Basically, Zenial can serve as a partner to the higher ed institution to both build new content as well as curate existing VR content that may be being produced by the university. We're very focused on STEM, but we're also looking at career and technical education opportunities. There's a huge need to get kids involved in understanding careers of the future. Um, the higher ed students in this scenario would actually be working in, in, in a real world project with us with a combination of SMEs from both the university and the high schools uh, and middle schools, as well as the, the middle and high school students themselves. So it's a really interesting partnership and collaboration across both. The, the benefits to students, we believe these would extend to, to higher ed as well, is just the whole notion of student inclusion and voice in the production of these experiences. I mean, we're producing experiences that we hope students will appreciate, enjoy, and learn from, but a lot of times, content is produced without the student at the center of it. We try to change that completely. It's also about future of work. It's about creating future product designers and developers. 
Yes, they're going to learn some code, but really code may change so much in the next five years. I really envision that coding in 10 years will be done by voice. It will be done uh, almost as instinctively as turning on lights. So the idea of learning a code base is important short term, but the long term value is to really think creatively and to be a product designer. And that's what we're helping students uh, become. The approach that we have in mind, and this is very flexible, I'd love any input and ideas, anybody that wants to, to, to jump in on this and help shape this, um, but the idea is to basically work with universities to help identify opportunities to produce VR content, connect with the right K-12 students and SMEs, and actually build these experiences in an agile manner. Xenial Digital then offers the value of being able to curate and manage and long-term, manage these experiences over the long term, so that we add them to our platform, make them available to K-12 students worldwide. Um, we would reference the university, the K-12 at the institution level, but also at the individual student level, so students have <laughs> referenceable work product that they can take uh, when they go off in the, in, in the workforce. Um, the benefits for higher ed, in our opinion, are that it's a great marketing and recruiting opportunity because your name is actually connected with an experience that students are using to learn every day. Uh, there's no cost or very low cost to the, to the institution, depending on, on what we're building and how we're building it. There is a potential to monetize uh, the content, depending on what we're building. And the university, as well as the high school, receives full access to the curated ex experiences at no cost as well. That's my pitch. My name is Lorenzo Valone. There's my phone number. You can use that uh, phone if you have one to uh, call me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Lorenzo can be found in the immersive learning channel of our Shaping EDU Slack. Um, Tom Hames has also posted materials in the Humanizing Learning channel all about his project, Deep Thought. Um, we'll give him an opportunity later uh, to pitch that in a, in a future Shaping EDU Live, but feel free to go in there, comment, and Tom's happy to answer any questions and chat about it. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us live here today during the town hall. Um, I hope to see you next time, uh, May 28th. It's going to be our uh, artificial intelligence themed uh, Shaping EDU Live. And then June 27th is our Shaping EDU Live on uh, data-driven approaches for student success. Uh, thank you all so much. I hope you access and share the communique. Um, and we're going to do one quick final screen share. If I could just ask Karina to share the beautiful art she's made while all of us have been sitting here talking and listening. She's been sketching. <laughs> share screen. Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Pay no mind to the woman behind the curtain. <laughs> okay. The most dramatic reveal there ever. Whew, there's a lot there. Awesome. Thank We're you so much. Oh, this Stay is tuned good. for more color. Yes, we'll be taking the final version of this and posting it to the Shaping EDU website along with all other materials as always. This meeting will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel as well as on our website. Um, until next time, keep dreaming, doing, and driving. Thank you so much, everyone.